All right, so we go to a new tab. And then I will start by telling you about something not quite related. Network is working, everything is working. It should work, come on. Yes, excellent. So what we will do is we will use uh, chat GPT to ask it questions. But before we do, um, and then we'll validate stuff here. Okay, so before we do that, uh, about chat GPT, uh, there is a, a very famous, uh, a very famous uh, thought experiment, uh, which is from eight, uh, 1980. So there was a kind of a, 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 a good, like relevant philosopher for us, uh, Cyril. Uh, and he was, he wrote a book uh, called uh, Brains, Minds and Programs. And he was kind of interested like at the at in eighties, there was a lot of discussion about like what computers will be able to do and what they will not be able to do. And you're probably familiar with the uh, Turing test, right? So Turing kind of was the founder of a modern uh, computational theory, and he kind of devised a, a test and he said, if I can converse with a machine. So I, I, I am kind of locked in one room and then in the second room, there is somebody or a machine. And we just kind of uh, have like, uh, I write stuff and put it through a little window and then the, I get the answer. And if I can do that and I cannot distinguish that that was a machine, then it will pass the test. And that means that thing inside is as intelligent as human, right? So that was kind of a human um, um, level of, uh, of intelligence. But there was a, a different guy and this guy said uh, the same kind of setup but he posed a slightly different um, experiment. And the experiment is known as a Chinese room. Do you know just Chinese room? Who of you speaks Chinese? Nobody, perfect. So the experiment is as follows. You don't really speak Chinese, but imagine that you do. Imagine that you speak Chinese and there is, again, you are locked in a room there is a small window and in the other side, there is another room. And then what you can do is you write questions in Chinese uh, and on, on piece of paper and give it to the system to, through the window. And inside the window, there is a human who takes those uh, pieces of paper with the Chinese characters and has like a big uh, lookup table and checks, checks the characters and finds a number of the drawer he needs to get the new characters from. And he, the person inside the other room, basically takes your input, see the, the character, looks up in the lookup table, says, okay, draw 921, goes to the drawer, takes the drawer, see is there is there is an answer or another drawer. And then if there is an answer, he kind of copies that character to the, uh, to the paper and gives it to you, right? So that person in the other room doesn't speak Chinese. The person in the other room is like you, right? Yeah. Can you say that in uh, North Chinese? Yeah, exactly. So that's what this guy was asking, right? So you can converse with this room, even though the person in that room doesn't speak Chinese, definitely. He doesn't know Chinese. But he was asking, is the room, does the room knows Chinese, right? Is the room intelligent enough to say, now the room speaks Chinese? What does it mean to speak Chinese, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's the same with this guy. like. If I ask it questions and it gives me answers, is it what does that mean? Can it actually do programming? Or is that thing the same capable as the person who doesn't know Chinese but can kind of do the lookup thing, right? Yeah. Do you know English? I know English. Is your brain on it? Probably not. <laughs> Isn't that the same? Thing? Yeah, so it is kind of the same type of thing, yes. So there is a uh, there is a certain level which is kind of uh, dumb, it's mechanical, and there is a certain level which is a little bit beyond that, right? Uh, but 
That's right. So if, with with the room thing, like if we if we consider the um, is this one better? Yeah. So if we consider the room, and like here here is this uh kind of a person who converses with the room, and there is the person inside the room who doesn't have a clue about Chinese, right? But there is this big drawer kind of thing. And the room together, so the, this knowledge base, this drawer thing, together with that person, you can say the whole room is more than just this person, right? So it's the same with my brain. Like me and my brain is just more than my neurons processing the information, right? Uh, so th that's exactly what, what this guy was asking, right? Um, yep. Brain is the book and the, the guy is your airspace. It's, yeah, so I we we're not gonna solve it, right? But what I'm trying to get it is that um, Chat GPT doesn't really know anything. It it is more like it's kind of a little bit like that person, right? So Chat GPT is like that person, but who is kind of really dumb. That thing is quite good. Like the the Chat GPT drawer is pretty excellent. Like looking things up. It's very good, but chat GPT is this, right? Uh, together with the knowledge base, with all the models that chat GPT has, together they are pretty impressive, but you, you kind of cannot expect that chat GPT actually understands anything, right? They, they don't understand Chinese, like it doesn't understand Chinese. It, it kind of uses the knowledge base, which is pretty good, right? So that's kind of, uh mechanically how how it operates so uh let's do a couple of things so the first thing is uh heap and stack we're not gonna ask it about heap and stack because we already know it right so what's uh heap and what's stack um Um, right, so we're going to get the C code for a student, hopefully. So what's heap and what's stack? Why do we have those two concepts? Perfect. No, oh, it's kind of elaborate. It's asking user for shit. That's nice, but we, we just needed the first line actually. <laughs> so we just needed that. So um, you can see the code. Is it uh, not too small? Okay, so uh, in this function, in function main, what is S? Is S allocated on the heap or is S allocated on the stack? Yeah, yep, yep, you first. I have a hard time differentiating them, but it's <laughs> on the same uh, place where main is, right? Yeah. I think it's the stack of the name, but stack and the stack of the each other. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And like, what there is some dynamic delegate thing on the heap. Okay, I will stop it. Yeah, so it is on the stack. Um, so let's let's make a copy. Um, so let's say. Lecture. All right, so we'll have 
a little bit of code here to talk about. So we have um, we have this, uh, and S, the space for S, uh, which contains an array of fifty bytes, followed by the int and followed by another int, is allocated on the stack because it is part of the memory for this function, right? Yeah, 50 car. Uh, I believe it is, unless it is uh, some fancy UTF-16 stuff. Normally, it's just byte. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, perfect. Thanks. Uh, can you write me a method that updates student age. So now let's, oh, I should say function maybe. So if we look at this, uh, if, oh, in, into this function, um, every function has a name, every function has a return type, what it returns, and every function has a list of parameters. Uh, and then we have a chain of calling functions, right? So when we write a program, we basically start with main. And then unless we write spaghetti code that everything is in main, then we don't call any, well, we will call our library functions, hopefully. Uh, but we compose that main is like some sort of manipulation of everything else, right? Um, yeah, we lost the... <laughs> We unfortunately lost the, let's see. So the advantages of um, of stack and, and stack, so if you, if you, this one was the better one. So you have your program. And your program will have kind of um, a read-only section, which is in memory. So if, if if our memory goes from zero upwards, then your code will be in memory. And then in memory, there will be kind of a read, uh, read-only um, uh, space, which is for all the static symbols and for things you can only read. You cannot change it, right? Uh, and then you will have a space, which is the stack. Uh, and stack kind of goes, um, it, it is actually using like a stack data structure. So it goes like what we were doing with uh, stack in, in Haskell. We kind of are built, you can put things on top and pop things from it, right? So the moment you call a particular function, in our case main, there is a stack frame allocated for main. And then all the variables which main needs are kind of allocated in that space on that on that uh, on that uh, stack frame. And then yeah, so this is not uh, really working that well. Um, let's try that. Yeah, maybe the network is slow or something. So anyway, then what hopefully we will get, we will get uh, an update um, function. So we will get some form of um, update. And then this update function needs to update the age, right? So if we say update age, we can pass a student. So we have a student to, to, to pass in. So let's say it's S and then new age, so let's say 23. And then we have a choice. So a choice is um, we either do it by value, so we update the value of the student age by value and return a new student, and that's what we've been doing in Haskell all the time, right? In Haskell, we've been giving a, a function something, and then function was returning a new thing with modifications of what we wanted, right? So if we had this code written in, in Haskell, we would have uh, a record type with student fields, 
we would have an update age function. The update age function would take a student and return us a new student, right? So this guy would return us uh, a student, right? Um, and it would take kind of a student in and return a new one. And that would be kind of a passing by value, right? Uh, so hopefully we can get that code in C. Um, um, it doesn't remember this. Okay, but we can say write code in C that has a struct with student with a name, ID, and age and write a function that updates age. Okay. Send. Yeah, so it's not really collaborating. Um, but it will either do it by value or it will do it by pointers, right? And see, you do it either by pointers or by value. What would you do? What would you normally do if you were doing it in C? Why? Yeah. Yeah. So why you don't want to return anything? Yeah, so that, that's that's a good point. Like you will get the modification done in place, right? So then you don't need to return and then you need to assign anything, whatever. It, you have this kind of modification done on the place in memory, right? But the main reason is that we don't want to make copies. So making copies is kind of inefficient and like are passing larger things like this, especially if you have kind of a larger array into your data structure, that would be costly because you have to allocate memory for it do a copy and pass things kind of continuing doing that, right? So what we would normally do, we would uh, say it's a pointer, right? So, oh, come on. We would say there is, um, yeah, I haven't done C in a while, so I don't know if the pointer is here or before the S, but you would have to put the star somewhere, right? Where is star comes here or after? You've done C recently, yeah? Yeah, exactly. Good. So you would do that, and there is this holy war. Is there space here? <laughs> or is there space here? Of course, it doesn't matter, but for a lot of people, it matters a lot, right? They say, ah, the star should always be to the variable. No, it should be to the type. So <laughs> you can have no space, or you can have two spaces. You can have like this. <laughs> so uh, although this might actually confuse the, the parser. Anyway, um, so then you would do it by, by pointer, but if you were to do it by pointer, and if you were to, so if, if we say um, S name, um, let's don't deal with name, let's do with age, right? So we have a 20 years old, and then we say update age S um, 23, then uh, that would work. <laughs> as long as we actually don't have it like this, if we have it like this, that would not work, right? Um, you would get a problem and you kind of need, first of all, you need to do this. Uh, and second of all, you actually need to allocate S, right? because we have just a pointer to S, but we haven't actually allocated our struct yet, right? And this allocation you would do with malloc, right? So in um, in C++, uh, you would do with new, and uh, C you would do it with malloc, and then this guy, this malloc guy, allocates space in the heap. So it's not any more space here, it's the space at the end of the memory uh, which you have, and that space is dynamically allocated and released for you, right? Uh, by by calling those uh, memory uh, memory functions. So, yeah, this this thing kind of completely blew up uh, in the lecture, which 
Yeah, I, I was hoping it, it's not gonna happen, but um, we have to write our code ourselves, right? So if we were to actually pass it by pointer, we would have to allocate it, then we could do it. And then you have this kind of indirection, right? So you have, um, if, you, if you're doing it uh, directly, so I have my function, uh, you have your function, so update function. And then this function has a certain parameters which are passed to it and they are allocated on the stack. So it will have the parameters there uh, from the parameter list. It has the return, what needs to be returned, uh, which is also allocated on the stack. And then it has the internal variables and they are also in the stack. And then the internal variable for us is the pointer so there is a, a uh, there is a variable which points to a memory in the heap, and the memory in the heap has all the fields for the struct, right? Um, so it's not um, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have our um, and this guy goes from the top here. So every allocation is in the RAM. And this one is kind of more managed by the operating system together with your read-only stuff from your program. Um, I need to unblur the screen for these guys. Um, yeah, although it will probably not be that visible anyway. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so so the difference is that in here, um, if we're using s by um, if we're using s by value, then we already have the space allocated for s struct on the stack. Uh, if we alloc if we operating on the pointer, then we have a pointer allocated on the stack, but the actual struct is allocated on the heap, right? What's the advantage of stack? The advantage of stack is that it's super fast. And often compilers can do a little bit of magic and keep your local things. Like if we if we say, for example, that main has a int, uh, I don't know, some sort of uh, default h equals that to 10, then this int will be allocated on the stack. And very often that int, um, so this is our main, and this int will be allocated on the stack, but actually it will not be in the RAM at all. It will be in the CPU register uh, such that you have very direct quick access to it, right? So you don't really need to go to memory to um, like the CPU, um, CPU will kind of have have it in the register, one of the registers. And it, when you say, you know, do something with uh, with this default age, it will say, yeah, yeah I, I will do it immediately. And don't, don't even need to go to RAM to kind of uh, look for it, right? All this stuff usually sits in the program cache. And then it's also very quick to, to check, to, to use. And then the stuff from the heap, that requires kind of a memory access, right? So that is kind of a slow. Uh, this kind of uh, using something with the register, I don't know on modern CPUs, like, uh, but it used to be about 100 times faster than doing something. Um, you know, it was 10 times faster than doing anything from the cache. And then doing something from the cache was 10 to 20 times faster than doing kind of memory access, right? So if you have something here, then it's about 200 times faster than if you have to look it up from the heap, right? 200 times, right? So it's huge impact, right? So if you can keep something by value on the stack and it's small enough that you can do it, then it's actually super faster, right? Um, so when I ask you, what would you do? Would you pass something by pointer or by, would you kind of uh, do a copy? Uh, then it actually is not as obvious answer that you should always do things by pointers and heap memory because doing small things uh, 
for small data chunks by value actually is faster, like substantially faster. Yeah. Then what it's speed is that it will do something like pass by reference. So, so that's what we that's what I call pass by pointer, right? Yeah, but uh, from the from the no. Uh, you can't. No, I mean, uh, you, you can, but it's sort of like the access wise from the CPU point of view, it's kind of the same. It's the same. Yeah, it's the same. It's, it's already on the stack, right? Yeah. So so in, in, in here, like, let's say our student is just Asian ID, right? Um, if that is the case, it's kind of a small data structures with just two, uh, like eight bytes or like whatever the int is. Uh, then what you actually would do, you would actually do it by value and by copy because then it's super fast. Then the CPU would probably keep it all in registers and locally in the cache. And then all the manipulations will be super fast and you never need to go to the main memory for access, right? <clears throat> so if, if the data is small, there is kind of a tendency to do things by value, right? And Java is incapable of doing that. In Java, if you define a class or if you define a, anything like a struct, then you have to use everything by pointer. Like you cannot say, I want to pass it by um, by value, right? It, it's always kind of done by, by pointer. So this is kind of the... Um, pass by value or pass by reference. Okay, so let's do that. Uh, let's imagine that we have this struct uh, in, in Golang, right? So in Golang, we would have, um, we would say um, there is a type um, student, which is a struct. And then we would say the same thing. So let's say we have an age, which is an int, uh, an ID, which is an int. And then what we would do with the update function, update age, we have the same choice, right? So in Golang, if we say main, um, then we can say I have S, which is a student. Uh, and that would allocate a student on the stack. And then I could say age equals 20 and then update, update S, update H S 23. So that would, that would work. And now how would we implement func, func update H? So, okay, we passing by value here, right? So we pre-allocated the space for students. So we passing by value. So we say we passing a student S and uh, H int, right? So that would be the code of uh, func. Say it again. Uh, in Golang, you do type after, yeah. Correct? Other people? Yeah? Say it again? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. You're right. You're right. That's correct. You, yeah. So if you want to expose it outside the module, you would capitalize it. If you just want to keep it inside the module, you can use a lowercase. Uh, so we capitalize things that are public and um, lowercase, which are not. Uh, if this is all in one module, it can be small. Um, in Haskell, it has to be capitalized because all the types have to have a capital letter. So here we would say S H um, equals H. So would that work? Would that code work? No, because, yeah. We are not passing a reference, exactly. So this code will not work because 
we're not passing a reference to um to s so in golang we would have to say i'm passing a reference to s and we are having the star here saying it's actually a pointer to to s and that will work okay so that will work in golang that will work so let's go here and say i have um okay so in c I have said that I have uh, S, which is a student. Uh, and then I say student H is H, and then update. And then we say, OK. Um, so we have the same code. And we say um, S H equals student and H. Okay, so now we have um, H. Okay, and that doesn't work, of course, because we're passing by, by value. So it doesn't work for the same reason it didn't work in Golang, right? So now we say, aha, uh -huh, we have to pass it by, by reference. So we update that. We say, yeah, it's a pointer. And will that work? Yep. Yeah, it's supposed to be void function. I think it might work actually, but let's say we would need to change that to this but the moment yeah all right so that that will work let's say i uh, how can we break it so let's say we have a new function, which is, yeah, let's say update h returns us, we have another struct error, and it will have an error code, error code, okay? And then this function returns us um, error pointer. And for func, we say this guy also has an error pointer. And it's the, defined exactly the same way, right? So now we say update and we have an error in Golang. And in C we have update and we have an error here. So we say A, E is of type error pointer to error. Uh, is that correct? Error E, you're right. So it's like that. Perfect. Okay, and in update H, we say, okay, we kind of have an error. We have the error E, and it's... Uh, uh, error type, 
and it's an empty, yeah, it's an empty uh, error, right? So we update the age and we return a reference to E. And here in Golang, we do the same. We say we have an E, which is an empty, em uh, empty error, and then return E pointer. I mean, reference. OK, so C++, C and C++ first. Will that work? Yeah, why not? Exactly. Very good answer. So here we allocated E on the stack for the update age function, right? So remember when we said main frame stack is here, then main calls uh, update age. So then update age frame stack comes here. Uh, and then update age update H, it has uh, allocated uh, error uh, thing and the parameters and all that stuff. And then when we finish, if we hit the closing bracket of the update H, this frame is popped from the stack and this frame is left. We go back to the control to the line number uh, 16. And then this assignment, doesn't work anymore because the reference to this E from the stack is gone, right? Because the, the whole frame has been deallocated. So the moment we call, the moment we hit the closing bracket of a function, all the stack allocated things from that function, which in our case is E, the pointer to S and this H parameter. So it has three things. It has the uh, E, from the from line number 23 it has the s pointer from the parameter and it has the h which is the the int uh int h uh all those things are kind of uh gone right um so you will get an undefined behavior and the compiler will uh, most likely complain a modern compiler will complain that you're doing something fishy here, like you're not supposed to get the reference to the stack value that has been just deallocated by this closing bracket, right? So now we go to Golang. Will this code in Golang work? <laughs> it does, exactly, it works. In, in Golang, uh, it will work, even though you would think that E is allocated on the stack, right? But what Golang compiler is doing, Golang compiler is checking uh, what's going on. And the Golang compiler sees line number 41 and says, okay, we need to allocate um, E on the stack. And then it allocates, like it thinks, I will allocate E on the stack. It goes up to here and says, ay, 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 we're gonna return a pointer to something that we have allocated on the stack and that's illegal. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna change our mind and we're gonna allocate E on the heap instead. So this allocation of E in Golang actually dynamically by the runtime system and the compiler is decided to be done on the heap instead. So this works because E is not on the stack and you as a programmer, you don't control what is and what isn't on the stack. You as a programmer give hints to the compiler that you think it should be on the stack and the compiler says, no, 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 you know, you cannot have that on the stack. You have to have that on the heap, my friend. And it allocates that on the heap, right? Whereas in C, the compiler will do exactly what you tell it to do and then it will break, right? So E is on the stack because it E should be on the stack and then it will break. So for this to work, you manually have to say, no, we're not allocating E on the stack. We are allocating a pointer to E on the stack. And then we actually use malloc for, for E and kind of allocate um, E on the heap ourselves. And then we can return pointer to E. Uh, then we don't actually call it a pointer because E is already a, a reference or a pointer to E, right? So in C or C++, you have to do it explicitly 
in, um, in Golang, um, the compiler and the runtime system will decide that for you and it will work fine. And it is actually idiomatic for uh, pointer types to say something like this, right? Uh, to say, I will have uh, a new value, which is kind of like allocated on the stack, but I got want a reference for it. So you have to allocate it for me on the heap, right? There is a call uh, in, in Golang, like you can of course use make um, for allocating structures on the, uh, on the heap and you can um, use, but the more most idiomatic way for doing a heap allocations is just doing that. Or like even 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 that is is idiomatic, right? But that would definitely break C or C plus plus code because that's kind of illegal. So here we kind of touched on um, on two important things. So one important thing is that every function call gets put a frame onto the stack frame, and then if you're doing recursive calls, that's gonna wind up blowing your stack, right? So if you have um, recursive calls, which cannot be tail recursive and cannot be done in such a way that you can kind of uh, wrap the whole power into like a, just one level and kind of uh, continually call yourself up, then um, eventually you will kind of exceed the stack limit and the program will crash. Um, so when you're doing recursive calls, you have to think how the recursion happens and if my recursive call is the last thing to the same function without leaving any, anything on the stack frame, then you can kind of do that. You can kind of do passing because if everything you're passing is passed by the parameters, the compiler can work it out how to tail recurse yourself into the same stack frame such that you don't get this kind of tower. But if you're calling yourself and you're leaving some state which the return needs to use, then you have to have the tower because each go back will use something from the previous uh, stack frame, right? Yeah. Isn't that what we're doing in Haskell? So in Haskell, we kind of, we don't care and the runtime system and the compiler works things out for us, right? So most of the time it can work out what you want to achieve because you're kind of doing it more declaratively than telling exactly what should happen. Uh, so you declare like I have this recursive call and the compiler will work, work out how to avoid blowing the stack, right? Uh, so I've noticed the longer I leave my program running, yeah. the longer it takes for it to shut down when I press Q or click to X. So I'm thinking it's like evaluating and going out after all the recursive calls. It that, There is some something like that happening, yes. So there will be some, um, Haskell is quite clever in organizing a data structures and so on. So for example, for lists, like if you, because we always pass something like we pass this big list and we want the big list back, right? And of course, Haskell is not doing copies. Like uh, those programming languages, if you pass a big list and you doing everything by value, they will be doing all the memory allocations and all the copies. Haskell is not doing that. Haskell is kind of keeping this big list in memory and trying to work out what you're doing with the list and trying to write like a big tree with all the diffs or changes what you did to the list such that it kind of keeps track in a more compact way of what is actually happening with the big list right um, so while while your program is running for a long time you end up with this kind of a big uh, black red tree which is a big data structure of keeping track of what has happened and then the longer you run, the bigger the tree gets. It kind of garbage collected, collects some of the branches at some point, uh, but it is true that the longer you keep it running, the, the structures get bigger and takes more time for, for everything to shut down. But it's not doing all the copies and it's also not doing this recursive uh, build up of stack because that would blow up. Like yeah. we often call main and we call main from main and then if you keep your program running forever, then it will kind of blow up, right? Uh, like if you try to do it in C or C++, if you try to call main from main, uh, yeah, you, you're gonna, you know, kill your stack pretty quickly. Uh, but in Haskell, it, it, it's much smarter than that. So it kind of works out how to deal with the recursion. So that's one thing. The second thing is 
locally allocated things in the stack frame are gonna get wiped the moment you're hitting the closing bracket of that function, right? So the moment you're hitting the closing bracket, all the things which are here are pre-allocated for the, so all the things that are passed here and all the things that are declared here, they're gonna get wiped because the stack frame is gonna get deallocated. Um, <clears throat> there are some effects, especially in the older C compilers, because that that stack frame, even though it's deallocated, it it like it's not immediately reclaimed, like it's not immediately uh, reused, or there is no rubbish there, right? Uh, although some of the modern architectures they have like a safety features which kind of zero everything that you deallocate, right? Such that to prevent certain types of uh, vulnerabilities and attacks. Because if you if you call something and let's say you have some passphrase there and then you go out and then somebody gain access to that other method, they could still read the stale memory and, and kind of read what was there, right? Even though it's like not being used in the program anymore. Um, so to avoid that, uh, some some architectures actually enforce cleaning up and uh, or putting some random things there. It only takes like changing a couple of bits and the, the whole thing becomes rubbish, right? Uh, so you don't know, but in the old days we were using that. Like we were using that to sneak in into a program and try to read something that has been already like uh, popped from the stack to see what was there to, for example, read, uh, you know, user password or something like this. But yeah, we, we're getting a little bit better in that. And also we're getting better in this uh, read only read only things. So now about this read only thing. Um, if I have, um, let's say we have our main and we, we said, um, I honestly don't remember how that would be in, um, uh, no, definitely not bar, but if I say, um, I would have to say something like car, um, Okay, so if I say Alice, it's one, two, three, four, five, plus the zero characters, I probably would have to say something like this, right? Um, so if I say name, can I do that and see? Yep. Okay, so it's an array of cars, right? And that would work, right? I think so too. So um, name, where is name? Stag or hip? And see, yep. It's on the stack. It's just here, it's on the stack. Uh, well, there are two things on the stack, right? What what are the two things on the stack? So name as a pointer to car, like as a pointer to the car array, right? So name itself as a pointer is on the stack and name as actual array of the six of six cars, right? Correct? Because name as a symbol is a pointer and then the pointer points to the array. So I need both things on the stack because I see in theory, I could say name plus plus, right? To get the next pointer after the name, right? Again, with the older C++ compilers, we often uh, did that because we could have an int here. I don't know, again, default age. Uh, and then if I have this name on the on the stack, I can work out where on the stack is my um, my DA by referencing the name instead of referencing the DA, right? So if I have kind of like, okay, let's let's make a simpler example. So let's say we have a byte byte b1, I have a byte b2 or and so to make it simpler, okay, 
and then int b3. So then I have my name and then I could say, I want to give me, um, I want to update b1 and I want to get the reference to b1 and I want to do two plus pluses on it. And then I will have it the referenced. And then I will say this is 21. So if I reference the memory location of my stack for B1 and I move twice, then I will get to B3, right? In memory, because it has to be laid out in memory like, like it is laid out in my code. Uh, the compiler will not touch it. The compiler will kind of uh, honor what you're trying to achieve. Not in Haskell and not in some other languages, but in C it, it will. And then to update B3, of course you can say B3, but you can also go from B1 and kind of get to there by doing memory uh, allocations, right? Uh, memory of uh, operations. So the point is that name has these two things. It has the pointer to where the array starts and it actually has the array. Um, so then um, when we, um, when we have this, we have some things on the stack, but what is Alice? So name pointer is on the stack, name, um, name things are on the stack and like the, the, So we have, I, I will blow up this frame, right? So we have one frame. We uh, That's the wrong frame. Uh, which one is your friend, this one? So we have the name uh, pointer. We have the name array uh, of, so we have the pointer and then we have the, in, so this is our stack frame for this function. And then here we'll have the start of the array and the array will have a uh, list in, in it, right? So it has that in memory, but this Alice itself, this symbol here, where is it? Yep. It's a string literal, exactly. And uh, most modern compilers will kind of uh, put it into this uh, read-only block as a string literal, right? So all the string literals that you have, and Alice included, would kind of end up here and there will be some sort of uh, you know, uh, pointer car that the, the program will kind of uh, can point into, right? Um, so this, um, this has to be uh, dynamically allocated and we have to fill, fill that up. But if we said that uh, this name is a constant and I'm not gonna touch this memory location and I'm not gonna kind of uh, be able to update the, uh, that, uh, the memory of name, then what it could do, it could say, yeah, great. So in that case, we don't need that at all. We can point you to this because you told us that it will be unmodifiable, right? You can only read from it, but you cannot touch it. So then it will be the, the stack frame will be simpler because you don't actually need that uh, extra memory there and here because you already have it here, right? So this is unmodifiable, uh, immutable string of certain size, right? So now why I talk about this? Any ideas? Yeah. I feel like it's relevant to when you're working with arrays and vectors and slices, but maybe that's not where you're going with this. Yeah, but even simpler, even simpler than that. So what is this? Yeah, list of cars. Uh, in the Rust, what is this? 
<laughs> yeah, what's this? Probably the same. No. Cars <laughs> was involved in like the EPA thing. No. Why do we have those two things in Rust? Yeah? Exactly. The string is basically representing this. It's representing read-only thing that is immutable, cannot grow, cannot be modified. All the string retailers are stupid in Rust. This is a list of cars. It can grow, you can mutate it, and so on, right? So that's why in Rust, you actually differentiate what do you mean? Do you mean this, or do you mean something that is actually a list of cars and you can change it, right? In C, you don't have str. Uh, it's kind of implied, like you cannot you know, tell, I want to have that immutable thing here because I'm not gonna be mutating it. You can only have, you can only do this uh, thing like here, right? You can do this, but you cannot, um, you can kind of enforce it by saying const and, 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 and so on, right? I, again, I'm, I'm not as familiar with the modern C. How can you actually make name to be str? But in Rust, it's simple. You just say it's a str. Yeah? You can say you can pass it around. Exactly. You can pass it around. You can initiate it once, of course. You can pass it around. And then it's very cheap because it is this kind of, uh, it's a, uh, it's a let name is Alice and name is three, right? And you can pass it around. Yeah. So now, if you want name to be mutable, if you would like to say mute, then you have to say it's actually string from or you, you say it from string, right? So you kind of need to turn that str thing into a string because string cannot be mutable. Great. So now we kind of deciphered the, the biggest mystery of Rust, why it has two things. Yeah? Uh, if you want it to grow, will it just allocate more memory? For string? Yeah, so if you want to grow Alice into some big... And Alice is a string. Yeah. Yeah. And you want to Yes, it will it will grow. So it has the mu uh, mutation functions which are kind of like append and so on, and they return a new reference. So if you exceeded the capacity, it will kind of uh, return you a, a new reallocated space. Yes, exactly. If you, you can also mutate things in place, so you can say I want to mutate the first character to a new character, and it will not allocate new space. It will kind of do it in place for you. But it depends what what function you call on the string, right? Yeah. Okay, so we kind of uh, got to a point where we can almost clearly distinguish what is on the stack and then what is on the on the heap and why why we're doing that. Um, the interesting thing about um, about C plus plus C is that you are doing kind of malloc and new, so uh, malloc and new uh, for C++. Um, they have um, an allocation function and deallocation function, right? Because if you allocated something, you can pass it around. And then at some point, you have to deallocate it. What happens if you don't deallocate something that you allocated? What happens? Stays in memory. Stays in memory. And then we call it a memory leak. So if you, especially if you're doing it in some sort of loop, you keep your program running, you have some functions which is called from time to time or every frame, and it doesn't deallocate something. And then your program kind of in memory grows until it kind of re-eats all the RAM and then it crashes, right? If you have a laptop with a lot of RAM, it, it's not gonna happen for a while, but eventually it happens. So that's why we use, um, debugging and profiling, and we say how much our program uses RAM and how much our program uses RAM after five minutes of running, <laughs> right? If you see a clear trend, 
your program is using more and more and more and more RAM, it's like, okay, why, right? You have a memory leak. If your program is using more RAM and then it clears it, more RAM and clears it, more RAM and clears it, then it's probably fine, right? Because you have some sort of ceiling and you're probably not gonna eat up all the RAM. So memory leaks are bad and you have to manage that yourself. In Rust, you don't deallocate things. You allocate things by kind of calling new. So you allocate the same way as you would do in a C or C++, but you don't deallocate. Why? Why we don't deallocate? I mean, Rust is a language kind of like C++ where there is no garbage collector. So, yeah. Why we don't deallocate? Yeah. What was it? Each um, like piece of variable has um, owner first. Yes. Okay. That owner goes out or something dies. Yes. Whatever it is. Exactly. So, uh, and that happens in the runtime or that happens in the compile time? In the runtime, sure. Yeah, so that happens in the compile time. Uh, so the compiler works out when something goes out of scope and then it injects the deallocation the there. You don't do it as a programmer. You cannot kind of do it unless you specify that you're doing something unsafe. But normally the compiler kind of checks when something goes out, out of scope. And then it says, okay, it needs to clear up. It needs to deallocate everything that uh, scope had, right? Um, so, that, that is kind of a difference between Rust and Golang, right? Because in Golang, all those deallocations happen at runtime. So the runtime systems keep track of what goes out of scope and is not needed anymore, is not referenced by anything else. And then it tick, like it marks it as a garbage and the garbage collectors deallocates all that stuff, right? Yeah. So I'm guessing compiling takes longer in Rust. That's right. So that that one reason why compiling in Rust takes longer than in Golang. Uh, and uh, you kind of have more control. So you, you, we, we can say in C, C++, you have kind of a full control, uh, but also full responsibility, right? Uh, in Rust, uh, you have also kind of a full control because you control the ownership, like you control as a programmer how your references are gonna pass the rounds, but you don't have a full responsibility so here is full full, and here is the compiler responsibility, right? In Rust, the compiler responsibility is to make sure that you deallocated everything that should be deallocated. In Go, uh, you have kind of a limited, uh, limited control because as we demonstrated, you kind of say, I want this to be on the heap, or I want this to be on the stack. Uh, the funny thing is if you set in, in Golang, if you said in Golang um, this thing here, you would say, I want the I want the pointer to it. I want this to be on the heap. And you don't return E. Um, we we don't actually return E, we return E like uh, and you say I want to dereference E and return it. Right? You 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 actually told the compiler, look, allocate this for me on the heap. Uh, and then make a copy from the heap into the return because I want to return by value, right? Mm -hmm. The runtime system will not do it. The compiler will say, are you kidding me? This is this is gonna be on the stack and I'm gonna just return it by value, right? It's not gonna touch heap at all. Uh, even though you, you said, I want this to be on the heap, but in C it would do it, right? And C, if you did that, it will do this on the heap and then it will de-reference the, the heap variable, make a copy, and then return the, the ear by copy, right? So um, in, in Golang, you have kind of a limited control. So here is the control, control, and here is the responsibility. So like this, we have a small array, and here you have a limited, and here is not the compiler, it's the compiler, uh, alone compiler plus runtime runtime system and the garbage collector and the runtime system are doing that for you, right? So you have no responsibilities uh, in Rust or Golang for managing memory. 
but you do with CC++. And that's the kind of the biggest claim to fame for Rust or Golang that you're not gonna have memory leaks or memory problems. Can you get a memory leak or memory problem in one of those languages? Unfortunately, you can, but they are re related to the bugs in the compiler, right? So not uh, programming errors. So the programming pro programmers cannot force memory leaks, uh, but you still may end up with memory leaks because the compilers have bugs. And then you have to program around those bugs. Uh, so that's kind of fun. But can you have memory leaks in C, C++? Of course. Uh, I always had, right? Every time I was programming C++, like 60% of my time was hunting the leaks. Like somewhere something was always not allo deallocated. Uh, so that is gone. So in Rust and Golang, it's gone. Uh, how about Haskell? So in, in here, like how much control you have is like almost zero, right? Uh, very limited, so very limited. Uh, you do have some control, but it requires coding in a very specific way. Normally you don't have control. And here is the compiler and the runtime system as well, plus runtime system. Okay, so one big, uh, claim to fame for Rust is the compiler takes care of the memory uh, deallocations. The other big, but, but then you say, yeah, but Golang and Haskell are do the same, right? So what is the second, the second differentiator? Yeah. What, what is the second big thing about Rust which differentiates it from Go and Haskell? It differentiates from C. Because and C++, because it says I am better than C C++ because the programmer cannot make memory pro memory bugs in Rust. Okay. But I cannot do memory bugs in Gorang and Haskell either. So what is the second advantage of Rust? It doesn't have a garbage collector. It doesn't have a runtime system at all. Not only garbage collector. It doesn't have actual runtime system. So there is nothing that kind of runs with your code. It's only your code, right? So if you're building a driver or if you're building like a, a things for your watch or something that has a very limited RAM and very limited CPU, it's bare bones. Like it only has what you actually program in that will run. There is nothing else. There is nothing extra. So the, the lack of runtime system is the big positive thing about system programming in Rust because it's very lean, it's very small. Whereas in Golang and in Haskell or in Java or in any garbage collected language or memory managed language, you have a runtime system. Uh, one language that has a very big runtime system is Python, for example, right? Um, J Java is also pretty big. So if you programming on some kind of a limited mobile device that you need to take care of the of the size, then Rust is kind of a, a, a good choice. Okay, so the experiment with ChatGPT kind of blow in, in our face. It didn't work in the lecture at all. So uh, lesson learned that I have to read pre, pre kind of do it. Uh, I cannot kind of do it in the lecture itself. Um, we learned a little bit about uh, heap and um, we learned about heap and stack and we learned more about you know, intricacies of Golang, that Golang kind of uh, blurs the boundary. Like talking about heap and stack on, in, in terms of Golang is kind of pointless because you as a programmer, you kind of don't have a, a choice. Um, and then we deciphered what string and string are in, in Rust, that there are two different things for representing two different things. String is for representing uh, string literals and constants. Uh, where a string is to represent a, a list of, uh, of actual characters. Um, and we learned about blowing up the stack by doing recursive calls, uh, which is very common in C and C++. And that's why in imperative programming, we often don't use recursion because it carries the risk of, of this. Like you have to be quite smart of how you can actually achieve recursion uh, to do that. So as a side note, I can also tell you that in Java, Okay, so Java to our table. Uh, can you have control over memory 
uh, limited. It's kind of similar to, uh, to, to Golang, right? So I would say those two are kind of similar. It has a little bit more control than Haskell, but uh, not, not more than, than Golang. Uh, and then it's the same. It's a compiler plus runtime system. And the runtime system is quite big. So the runtime system in Java is called Java Virtual Machine. Uh, it's like the whole computer which you have to run your Java on. Uh, and JVM, when the designers designed it, had kind of a big flaw that this is, did not allow um, this kind of a tail recursive call optimization. So in Java, all the functional languages are kind of, they really suck, right? Uh, it, it's very inefficient. So what is the alternative to, to Java in the C, C++ world? Well, C sharp, right? Whoops. So C sharp is the um, equivalent to Java pushed by Microsoft and it uses .NET VM, right? So it also has a virtual machine, same as Java, and it runs all the stuff on the .NET platform, on the .NET virtual machine, and Microsoft designed .NET much better. They knew about um, the recursive calls and op optimizations and so on, and the, the .NET is much better, much more modern virtual machine compared to, to JVM. So compared to, if, if you compare those two, they kind of look similar, but uh, C Sharp is uh, noticeably more powerful and, and better. Uh, and that's why on .NET you have, for example, F Sharp, which is kind of like Haskell uh, running on the Microsoft platform. All right, so that's it, uh, 10 o'clock. Um, thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah, many questions. <laughs> what would you like? Yeah, what would you like? Yeah. I'll come back to you. Yeah. Maybe an intro to Rust. Yeah. So uh, fundamentals for Rust programming, uh, basic. Thanks. We can do that. But like, are they, how much of Rust are we supposed to know before this new thing is on? Because I've been studying it a lot of long already. Yeah, that's what I was hoping. Yeah, we probably should know quite a lot because the uh, oblique one is, you know, covers quite a lot of chapters. Yeah. Um, but we can do some, yeah. Uh, yeah, you could. I uh, have a meeting though, oh. uh, so we kind of run out of time. Uh, but we can do it on Thursday. Uh, I would prefer you all to sign up and do it with uh, the teaching assistant if you can, uh, because then, yeah, I will. I will. I will talk with him. Yes. <laughs>